We are back. Robin Slim Show, we are back with 40-year acting veteran Stephen Manley. Good evening. How are you? Great. How are you doing? <laughs> Thank, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for having me on that show. Thanks for coming uh, on, dude. You, yeah, when you say 40 years, you know, that sort of brings up midlife crisis at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going through a midlife crisis right now. Yeah, and he's only, oh. he's only in his 20s, dude. Like I'm 28. Yeah. I, I'll be right. shocked if he right. makes it to 30, Stephen. Uh oh. <laughs> now, how long did you start? At, like, how long have you, like, when did you start? Did you start as a child? Yeah, I started as a child, uh, along with, you know, there's a lot of actors who are you know, uh, heroes of mine who've also started as children yeah. and they've trans uh, transitioned into adulthood. It took me a little bit longer than I thought, but, uh, yes, they started young as well. Just that... like I did. I was five years old Wow! and that was 1970 is when I got started. Wow. And what, what did you yeah. do when you first started? Was it commercials or did you jump right into TV shows? It was it was right into TV shows. Uh, I will give you the Cliff Notes version, or else it'll be like a ten part radio mini series if I give you the whole history. You know, yeah. my grandfather's got started in silent films. Uh, I, I'm adopted, but uh, the people who adopted me, my stepmom and dad, the mom's uh, father was from Italy, and he came over to America and he worked in a shoe shop, which he hated in New York didn't speak any English, and then when World War I uh, would take him as a doughboy, by the time he got over to France, a couple of days later, the war ended. So he became an American citizen. They shipped him back to New York, and he didn't want to go back to the shoe shop. He worked in a circus for a while, and eventually the circus hit Los Angeles, and instead of finding cowboys and Indians like he thought he would find, he found D.W. Griffith casting real Italians to play Roman soldiers, in the movie Intolerance, and he became one of the Roman soldiers and loved the film business and stayed out there, and he was an actor, wow. a bit player, and a stuntman all the way up until 1966, and uh, that's, yeah, that was his history. That's cool as hell because, um, like, a lot, of, a lot of times when you see them make stuff about Rome, they always get English people to play yeah. they always get english <laughs> right. and being italian that kind of offends me a little bit it really <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. right that's cool well, i i have a uh, gosh so many pictures of my grandfather he was my hero because he lived with us when his wife passed away i was very young i was three years old and he he moved in with us and uh, it was not uncommon for me to come around the corner and find him molding an old stick of nose putty and showing me how to make a nose or showing me how to make blood. Or he'd show me pictures of him as a cowboy or a German soldier or a chef or something like that, you That's know. so cool. Uh, telling me all, yeah, telling me how they used to make fake glass out of sugar. They no longer make it out of sugar. They still call it sugar glass. Well, they don't. But I always those... thought they did. No, no, they used to years ago. Now they make them out of plastics that break really easy, and they're a little more controllable, and ants still go after them to eat them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, my father, as so, a child, told me they made you know, the glass out of sugar in movies. Right. <clears throat> it's basically like a big lollipop, you know? So like an old-fashioned lollipop, it's the same process that it was you know, back then. Wow. But uh, anyway, when I was uh, five years old, he decided it was time that I join the Screen Actors Guild. He couldn't really get his daughter to do that, and it disappointed him in the 50s. Uh, she was more interested in going to the beach and getting suntan. And, uh, you know, I spent all my time uh, with, with Steve. Uh, his name was Steven Soldi. You can catch him in as one of the students in Frankenstein. Uh, he was with Gene Kelly and Singing in the Rain. Uh, Gene Kelly handed him the umbrella, you know, at the end of that famous routine. Yeah. You can find him with the Marx Brothers crowding into the stateroom and Night I at the Opera. The I mean, yeah, I mean, the list is almost endless. And I've got boxes, pictures of him, even his original costume test from Intolerance. It's a, a hand-tinted photograph. Wow. Uh, he knew Charlie Chaplin. He knew Lon Chaney. He knew Stan and Ollie. I mean, the list just goes on and on. And he became uh, Peter Lorre's personal stunt double and Edward G. Robinson's 
stunt double. And so every time you saw them do something dangerous, it was usually uh, Steve doing it. So when I was five, he took me down to the Screen Actors Guild, and he spoke in Italian to the head of the guild at the time. You could do that. And I walked out with a SAG car. And, uh, wow. you know, oh, uh, that's a amazing. talent a yeah, a talent agent saw me on a, um, uh, it was like a talent show at the time, it was called Juvenile Jury, and she thought that I had something that maybe she could use, and she started to take me on and send me out on auditions, and I basically learned to read by Steve giving me old film scripts to read, you know, when I was very, very little, wow. and before I even got my SAG card, he would show me pictures of him on film sets and show me what a light was and how it threw a shadow and how the camera saw you and how things were edited and that the monsters were real, but not really real. Look, they were made out of foam and sponge and grease paint and nose buddy and all kinds of stuff. So by the time I started to get some work, I, I really felt like I had some training under my belt, you know, mm. from, from my yeah. grandfather, and he meant the world to me. And there were a lot of old-timers still on those movie sets at that time that knew Steve before he retired. So nothing ever really nasty happened to me. I always had people watching out because I was Steve's grandson, you know, oh, and uh, they would show me how stuff was done. And uh, it was a wonderful education and a great way to grow up, you know. That's great, yeah, because usually you don't hear that about child actors. Usually, yeah. it's it's horror stories and all. Well, I witnessed a lot of horror stories, but you know, I I kept quite a distance from the horror, you know, mm. that, that would unfold before me, or if I saw somebody going down a bad path, wow. you know, and if somebody uh, saw that uh, the bad path was presented, they'd say, "Hey, Steve, this is how we set off a gun and a bullet hit goes off." Let's go watch that, you know, yeah. or we're going to blow this up or we're going to set this on fire or, you know, you see how we're lighting this, this leading lady over here. Take a look at this. So that, and I, I was more interested in that. Mm. I, unfortunately, I lost my grandpa uh, in uh, November of 74. I was one of the little boys uh, on the feature film, the Hindenburg that rode on the ship and crashed. And there was a, a family on there with a, a sister who was 18, a little boy who was eight. I played the six-year-old dead. And uh, the set was very, very dangerous, was on it for four months. It was a beautiful set. The art direction was incredible. I mean, to be a part of something like that, it was really unique, especially at the time when they didn't have digital effects. They actually built pieces of the Hindenburg under the wow. guise of people who worked on that ship, and then they burned it, you know. I mean, they tried wow. to burn it safely, but yeah. they burned those sets down with the actors in it and the stunt people and stuff. And uh, I actually got injured on the very last day. My mom had to leave me on location for a few days at the hotel, and uh, Steve had passed away, you know. And uh, when I came home, I actually came home with third-degree burns from that film set. Wow, and, that's what uh, I'm saying. Like, back in the yeah. day, I remember hearing about, like, the original, even the original, um, not the original, but uh, when they made the um, Twilight Zone movie, how people were killed mm -hmm. on that set. Like, oh, yeah, shit, like that yeah. was a risk you took as an actor back that's then. The wicked, the wicked. Yeah, that's the cool. I mean, it's crazy, but... when mm. she did the uh, you know, I, disappear. I, I, I wasn't there for that. I heard about what was going on, but unless you're actually there, you, you know, it's all hearsay and rumor mm. and guesswork. The Hindenburg had a lot of professional stunt people on it. And it was quite a dangerous set just because of the nature of what was going on, you know. Yeah. But it was it, it, it was an accident, and uh, you can see it in the film, you know, after I jump out of the Zeppelin. The interesting thing to me is, for years I had wondered about the guy who I played and what actually happened to that family. And the other day on Netflix, I saw a documentary on the Hindenburg that's about five years old, and the two surviving people on the ship, were the cabin boy and the guy that I played. Wow. He was on that documentary, yeah. So for the first time I saw him speaking, it showed pictures of his parents, and he talked about actually what happened to him, uh, you know, as uh, for in real life. Of course, we dramatized some stuff, but yeah. uh, it was really kind of chilling, and I'm wondering if he's still alive and I can just touch base with him somehow, you wow. know? That would be cool. Yeah, I, played, I was wondering if you I, ever got I, to I, contact somebody that you portrayed right right so that that would be a really neat thing but i i went on i was basically uh, not typecast 
But whenever they wanted somebody to play a starving European war orphan, I usually got the job. And, uh, you know, over my career, I suffered from rickets. I suffered from polio. I, I was a sculptor, but I had a speech impediment. You know, there was always something else uh, going on. Uh, my good friend Patrick Laberto, who was on Little House on the Prairie for years, along with his brother, uh, is still active. He produces, he acts, and he said to me, you know, you were always kind of a heavy drama guy. He said, I, I, I was more of a jock, an athlete. I could play a football player and more of the all-American kid, but whenever it said a Euro kid with an ailment, you usually, you know, booked the job. We knew you were going to get it. <laughs> uh, fortunately, I have filled out a little bit and kind of grown out of that, you know, um, <laughs> recently. Um, but yeah. uh, it's, it's terrific, you know. The stuff I've been doing lately has been really killer, and That's I'm cool. very, very grateful for it. Yeah, I was yeah. going to ask what you were recently working on. Mm. Uh, recently, there was a film called Ghost Hunters that just came out July 5th, and it's the first dramatic ghost story from Asylum. Asylum, as you know, they make Sharknado and all of its sequels. They make, you know, what they they admit to calling the Mutt Busters, you know, a, a big feature film will come out, and they'll run and put one out that's a little bit tongue-in-cheek, kind of based on the same theme. And they engaged a young man named Perry Teo, who was in charge of Cloud Atlas with Tom Hanks. He did the Gene Generation. He just had a film come out called The Curse of the Sleeping Beauty, which is kind of a dark, gothic film. And they wanted him to make a mockbuster of the new Ghost Hunter, uh, Ghostbusters that's oh, okay. just been released. Yeah. And he sat across from the table from them. And he said, I can't do that. I don't want to do that to my reputation. He said, why don't you guys take a risk on me and make a really good horror film? And the people will be hunting ghosts, but it's not going to be a comedy. And he made a bet with them, and they said, go ahead. And he submitted a script to them, and they said, go for it. And we shot this thing that was basically a gothic horror play in a wonderful location, and it's really scared a lot of people. Wow. I've gotten a lot of... Star Trek fans at the Star Trek conventions and stuff, they look at the poster and they say, okay, we're not going to see that, but we'll see the science fiction film you're coming out in. <laughs> so it's gotten, yeah, it's gotten some good reviews. You know, the professional reviews have been really good, and it is a genuinely creepy film. It's cool. very, very heavy. All the actors in there uh, with me, Francesca Santoro and, and Liz Fenning and David O'Donnell, Phyllis Spielman, boy, they all came to the table, and uh, we saw it as a unique opportunity to make a good, low-budget horror film that, that paid off with mm. some real real scares in it. So everybody worked very hard. I was very proud of, uh, of Perry and the film. So that's out right now. And then in September, Rogue Warrior Robot Fighter uh, comes <laughs> out. Sounds it, it, uh, that sounds amazing. That sounds great. Yeah, 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 there you go. It's exactly like what it sounds like. It's an action film. Uh, it stars Tracy Birdsall is, is the heroine in the movie. And it's directed by uh, a British gentleman who's become a good friend, both he and Tracy. His name's Neil Johnson. He's got kind of a cult following for the sci-fi films he's been doing. He was actually the first digital filmmaker about 20 years ago and, and has quite a reputation for the special effects he creates and the world's that he creates and Neil's been working on this one longer than any film he's ever done and put an awful lot into it and uh, the trailers look really really cool you know I mean yeah. I, I fry a few robots in it with a great big gun nice. and that looks really cool and he, he's got some good actors in it too uh, Daz Crawford from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is in there and William Kircher who was in the Hobbit uh, trilogy he's also in, in there with us so I'm looking forward to that. I, I see that on September 2nd. I'm going to go down to L.A. and see how that, uh, how that comes out. Nice. Now, so Steven, that's been great. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, everybody knows you were in Star Trek Three, but is there something you could tell mm -hmm. us that nobody knows about you? Well, uh, I tell you, the bug is out now. You know, we did the Pond Far sequences, uh, Robin Curtis and I. And Leonard Nimoy was really, really uh, adamant that it have a feeling uh, from another 
television series that I was in. I, I got to work with the great actress, Zora Lampert, who's still with us, and she, she played a gypsy fortune teller trying to find, uh, help me find peace with my mom who passed away where I, when I wasn't able to see her go. I was away on a trip, and that was in a series many years ago written by David Jacobs, who was a good friend of mine. And so the Pon Far sequences, Leonard had cast me as the young Spock. He wanted that to have that same feel. And a lot of the fans, they would say, boy, that was a sensuous moment. It was really uh, sensitive and this and that and the other. And Robin, yeah, Robin was really a wonderful woman and very giving and very warm and passionate. And I always joke to everybody, well, you're seeing the PG version. There is a NC-17 Bernardo Bertolucci version, (laughs) (laughs) which nobody has seen of the Bonfar sequences. And sure enough, when Leonard Nimoy passed away, yep, there was a picture of Robin reaching out and touching my face. And so I tell everybody, oh, you caught me. There's the Bertolucci version right there, you know? (laughs) Wow. Dude, that's awesome. I actually thought she was better at that character, too, than, like, I'm I'm kind of, I'm a little bit of a Star Trek fan. Uh That same character was in The Wrath of Khan, but it was Kirstie Alley that played her. That girl, yes, it was. Yeah, that girl mm-hmm. they got the player in the search for Spock. I thought did mm-hmm. the character w- was actually a lot better. Was a better character. I thought she was better at playing a Vulcan than Kiersey Alley was. It, Steven, are you a fan of it, the, the reboots? Uh, I'm I'm a fan of the original series. I'm yeah. a fan of the original films. You know, mm-hmm. um, but I'm I'm all for the Star Trek universe continuing. No yeah, problem. Yeah. You know? I, I, and, I think uh, they're amazing. I was a fan of the original series. I didn't see any of the movies, but um, when I was mm-hmm. younger, I've seen them when I got older. But I, 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 I do enjoy the reboots. I think they're great. And have you ever been approached with any of them uh, to be in any of them? Uh, I haven't been approached to be a part of any of the films uh, or the reboots. I was approached by some nice people to do a radio show uh, that was Star Trek-based. It was called Star Trek Excelsior. Actually, Robin participated in that as well, and so did Michelle Nichols. You know, they they lend their voices uh, to these things. And that was about three months ago. I think it's already been on the air, but it was neat to do a different character for a Star Trek uh, project, you know. But I uh, know I haven't been uh, approached uh, as of yet. Oh, you know? yeah. And um, who you've worked with so many great uh, names like mm-hmm. Carol O'Connor mm-hmm. and Michael Landon. Mm-hmm. Um, who has been your right. favorite to work with over the years? Boy, uh, Stephen, great experiences oh. with people. Yes. I'm sorry, it cut out for a minute. I was worried we lost you. Oh, uh, how about this? You got me now. Yes. Yep. Uh, okay, great. Uh, I've worked with some wonderful people over the years. The first person I worked with who was great was James Coburn, right? Uh, It was in a uh, film called The Carey Treatment, and uh, we had a scene where he was coming to take my mom, who was played by Jennifer O'Neill, out on a date. And uh, James Coburn was a great fellow with a terrific voice and uh, took to me, and we had a great time together. I also worked with Tommy Lee Jones. There was a surreal scene in a TV movie where he played Howard Hughes, and there was a flashback uh, surrealistic scene where he was talking to himself as a younger kid. And I spent a couple of days with Tommy Lee Jones on those scenes. That was really something else. That's amazing. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I was 12 years old and getting a real heavy method acting lesson from Tommy Lee Jones, you know, and we had a great time working together. And Zora Lampert, like I said, was just a wonderful lady, and uh, the scenes were very intense. My friend had written me, he gave me a gift, he wrote me into this television series that went for a season because I had worked for him before and something else earlier, and uh, I just saw Zora on an episode of Kojak that she won an Emmy for, and what an actress, boy. And uh, so I, I've been thinking about that an awful lot. I, I work with some great people, George C. Scott was a great fellow. Uh, Leonard Nimoy was wonderful. Yeah. You know? What was uh, and, Christopher uh, Lloyd like? Because I know he played one of the Klingons in that movie. Yes, he, he was very intense on his role. And I had known Christopher Lloyd from Cuckoo's Nest, 
Uh, I I didn't really watch Taxi, but I knew he was a part of the cast. Mm. And when I was on the set, he wasn't there for the first few days. He showed up the last couple of days that I was working. And I when I heard his voice briefly, I recognized him, but he had a lot of makeup on. And when I went to go introduce myself, he introduced himself very politely, but he was running his lines over and over and over again in his head because he really wanted to do a good job on that role. Wow. And when a guy is doing that and they're standing off to the side, uh, you let them have their space because he wanted that. To, it was very important for him to do a role like that. Yeah, you yeah know? he was so, so, that Dude, he seems yeah. like that kind of a guy who just, yeah, wants Real to do serious, it yeah. 100%. Right. And, you know, uh, the older I get, the more I have to do the same thing. You know, I uh, yeah. I just did a, 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 a TV special on National Geographic for Kevin Costner where I played Billy the Kid's good friend, Charlie Beaudry, you know. And, uh, you know, I got the crap shot out of me at the end of it by Pat Garrett. You know, they thought it was Billy historically and they shot Charlie by accident. And there was some great, great scenes in there, very heavy a lot of gun fighting, a lot of horseback riding, you know. So it was very important for me to keep the character alive, yeah. um, even between shots and stuff. Even with Ghost Hunters, all of that work, you know. Mm. So when a guy is getting into the zone, you, you say, thank you, nice to meet you, and you leave him in that zone, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I got a quick question. Um, back when the uh, special effects were harder, when there were put more effort into it and now we transitioned mm -hmm. to more of a digital age where there's probably maybe still more of an effort but it's not as dangerous it's not as like you know what i'm, I'm kind of getting not at here demanding demanding yeah. not as demanding do you think that was a positive transition or a negative transition well i i'll go off of what some other actors have told me who didn't have the experiences that i had back in the 70s man right yeah. um <laughs> Get, get, with all respect to Neil, who I love, and he's done some wonderful stuff in Rogue Warrior Robot Fight. I mean, there was no way he could have done the things that he's done in that yeah, film. Fortunately, a lot of my scenes, there's not a lot of special effects, but his special effects were very, very specific. There are other movies where people are acting to a green screen and a little ball at the end of a C-stand, and they don't know what anything is going to look like at all. And they've told me that they really feel kind of cheated with all of that. They have to use their imagination so much. And then yeah. when they see the final film, they don't know what anything's going to look like. Neil was really good with me telling me exactly what was going to happen. But I tell you, when you're on the promenade deck of the Hindenburg and the guys are dousing it in kerosene, and Robert Wise says, hey, there's an explosion, and everybody freaks out because the whole place tilts at a 45-degree angle. And they go sliding across the floor, yeah. or the floor of the Genesis planet opens up and the flames pour out. Or like one of my friends, and when I was doing the Hindenburg, a good friend of mine played the little boy in Earthquake who falls into the L.A. River on his bicycle. You know, That's real. they built those sets, and, yes. they, and it took them hours to put it together. And the stunt people, the actors, everybody are reacting to all this stuff going on. It was all really built. There's something about that that, yeah. that I think adds to everything. Yeah. I think know? it shows to the audience, too, when, when it's real. Yes. Yeah. You know, I'm a big fan of Jaws. The original Jaws is just a spectacular movie. It's mm. really a good film, and I watch it once or twice a year, and we definitely watch it on the 4th of July every year, you nice. know? Yeah. And Steven Spielberg is now saying, he says, look, he said, if we made Jaws in 2015 or 16 and we digit with, did it with digital effects, it wouldn't have the same uh, look. He mm -hmm. said it would be very, very easy to do, but he said there was something about building the shark, putting it in Nantucket Sound and dragging it through the water next to the orca that did something to people. Yeah. You know, even though they knew the shark was, you know, a prop, at first, you know, uh, when it first came out, he said it still did something. People were terrified of it, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I have to, I have to agree. I have to agree with that. I think, as far as safety goes, yeah, you know, uh, there's a lot of things they do with digital that's that are much safer. But mm. there's uh, as much as possible, I think, as you can have on the set without hurting people is is 
is great. Yeah. I like I like the fact that a lot some some of the new movies like the new Star Wars movie that just came out, some of the directors mm -hmm. are getting back to practical creature effects. Yeah. Like they haven't yeah. gotten back to practical yeah. with other things, but mm. with the monsters and stuff mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. Steven, we have to wrap this up, dude, but thank you so much for talking to us. It's been amazing. Yeah. Where can everybody find you? Uh, well, there's a website, uh, www.steven-manley.com. Okay. Uh, you can also get a hold of me through the IMDB. There's links to all that stuff, and there's links to everything that's out and coming out and coming up. Okay? Awesome. Cool. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Anytime. Have a great night, dude. Live long and uh, prosper. All right. Live long and prosper. <laughs> <laughs> Live long and pun far. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good one, Steve. Take care, man. Thanks a lot. Keep in touch. Yes. Yeah, man. Absolutely. All right. Bye-bye. Good night. I, wow. I didn't realize and, and how that's why we do this. Like, that was honor, amazing. Bro. That, was, that cool. was really cool. I didn't realize how without, late it without was. Without this cause... show, yeah. we would never be able to talk to people like that. Right, without that's this what I'm show. saying. Like, it's like... so great. That's really cool. Wow. All right, guys, we are going to break. Uh, our, back with Adam Podell. Our friend Adam Podell is next. Your message here. I just yep. uh, texted my dad, uh, who we were interviewing, because he's a huge Star Trek fan. Yeah, we'll have to send him that wow. link to that. All right, guys, we'll be back.